Open your Bibles tonight, if you would, please, to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, knowing uh, I was going to be ministering tonight, of course, as every minister, we seek the Lord in prayer. And this passage, really just a few words of the passage, was dropped into my heart. And uh, we're going to endeavor to teach, preach a little bit from it tonight. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and you'll find our text in verses 20 and 21. 2 Timothy 2, 20 and 21. If you found it, say amen. The Apostle Paul would write to his young ward in the faith and say this, But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. We are jumping into the middle of a passage that really starts in verse 14 and then runs to the end of the chapter, and we'll be referring to it as we travel through. But the little phrase that was dropped into my spirit was vessel of honor, vessel of honor. What does it mean to be a vessel of honor as Paul spelled it out here, why did he take the time in his very last epistle to say this to the man that would very likely be guiding the church after his demise? We need to understand what it means to be a vessel of honor, and we need to understand how to obtain being that vessel of honor, because this is what Paul says that he desires for Timothy to experience. If he desired Timothy to experience, I have no doubt that the Holy Spirit wants us to experience it tonight as well. So we want to minister for a few minutes, vessels of honor. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight in the precious and holy name of Jesus. I thank you for the opportunity that we have to minister your word. And one more time, Father, we pray for the true teacher, the true preacher to come, the Holy Spirit, the one who makes teaching and preaching easy. And we pray for him to rest upon all of us in this congregation to open up our eyes, open up our hearts to the truths of your word, and we'll give you praise and we'll give you glory for it. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen and amen. Think of it, if you would, the last epistle The last words, as has often been said by anyone, is so vital and so important. But words directed by the Holy Spirit, directed to the chief master builder of the early church, are important, important indeed. Scripture, God-breathed instruction, is given to us here. And in his last hours, in his last perhaps weeks or months, we're not quite sure how long before Paul would be executed that he wrote this to Timothy, but it was just a very short time. In his last letter, in a cell underneath the cell, he says to this this young man that he has trained since he was born again, become a vessel of honor. What that says to us is that we need to become the very same today. And a vessel of honor, again, Paul is speaking in the terms of a metaphor. He's speaking of a great house, and scholarship is divided as to what they think that great house is. Some would declare the house the the body of Christ, and in the body of Christ, there's some vessels that are of honor and some of dishonor. In other words, some uh, scholars say are Christians and others are not Christians at all. Other scholars say the same idea that perhaps the metaphor indicates uh, the body of Christ and some Christians are very, are very 
how shall I say it, in tune with what God wants and are pushing toward what God desires, while others are very lax, they are very apathetic, and those are vessels of honor and dishonor. Brother Swigert, in his commentary, deals with the house as the Christian himself, where he deals with the idea of the fruit of the Spirit versus the fruit of the flesh, the fruit of the flesh being a vessel of dishonor and a fruit of the Spirit being a vessel of honor. Ladies and gentlemen, what we all agree on is this, that this Christian that we are, this Christian experience that we have is destined to provide for us the means by which we may become a vessel of honor. Probably in the idea that we might carry it home in to you is if you have a special meal and your wife goes over to that special place where she pulls out dishes that you only see once a year. She pulls out the best china and she sets the table and she gets the, the best glasses that you haven't seen because they've been hidden in the cupboard. Maybe it's Thanksgiving, maybe it's some special occasion, but you don't see those vessels very often. They are special, they are unique, they are saved for special occasions, saved for the specific occasion, and those are, if you will, vessels of honor. Now, a vessel of dishonor uh, is the plastic bowl that you're your wife feeds you from most evenings. Now, you're probably in trouble if it says Fido. <laughs> but the idea is that there's a distinct difference from a vessel that is set aside, that is designated, that has been wonderfully crafted and, and perfected for a specific time and a specific use as opposed to one that is not. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to be that vessel that has been shaped and formed and compiled into what God wants me to become. I want to be that person that, that seeks after the highest the highest potential of my Christian experience. And in that, I do not mean that I am someone that's trying to push towards a ministry because in this sense, Paul's not talking really much about ministry as much as he's talking about the character change and transformation of the individual. We need to be Christians, not in word only, not in doctrine only, not in knowledge only, but from the heart into interior on the outside, from the heart on the inside must come the actions and the attitudes of the, of the individual. And when we're born again, when we're first brought into the kingdom, what we are going to be isn't quite yet seen. Oh, well, we might see some elements of it. We might see some processes, in, in fact, in place. We might see some original uh, evidence, but we're not yet what God wants to make us. He wants to make us into that vessel of honor, into that special vessel that he can use for a specific purpose. But ladies and gentlemen, again, I'm saying it poorly, but what God is really interested in doing is ultimately moving us in character formation far more than he is in just utilizing us. He loves us as the body of Christ. He loves us as his child, but I'm more interested in seeing my children being developed into the image of Christ than I am seeing what they do for Christ. Because if you're being molded into the image of Christ, then what God can use you for, what God can do in you, what God can do through you becomes an even more powerful powerful element. But we have to become something before we do something. That has to be the emphasis of our Christian experience. So many times we're running after uh, the, this idea of ministry and that that's the most important thing. Ministry is important and everything God has called you to do is vital. But I'm here to tell you that the world is crying out to see the body of Christ not just talk about or explain, but look like and live like the Christ that they are proclaiming. And that, go ahead. That's the vessel of honor that I want to become. 
Now, the Bible says that if a man therefore purge himself from these, and I'm going to move beyond that phrase for a minute because before we get the idea of what we're purging ourselves from, I want to take a look at what a vessel of honor actually is. Here, a vessel of honor then is three things, sanctified, meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. And again, this is character formation. The Bible says that we are to be sanctified. And that term again has been the, the, the concepts that we have preached for over 25 years here in, in learning the message of the cross and trying to get us to understand what does it mean to grow? How do you grow? What does it mean to be sanctified? Well, to be sanctified simply means that we've been set apart for God. That at salvation, the moment we said yes to Jesus, we're no longer our own. We're bought with a price. And at that point, in time forward, we are to glorify God in our body and our spirits what's belong to him. So the moment you say yes to Jesus, you are sanctified, set apart for God. But you've got to understand that God doesn't set apart something that he hasn't first freed from the penalty of sin. He frees you from the penalty of sin, and he sets you free from the power of sin. Your union with Christ, becoming one with him, becoming one with Christ at the moment of salvation, not only causes you to be set apart for God, but qualifies you as a believer to be what we call sanctified, freed from the penalty of sin, and freed from the power of sin. And this includes all four of the major sin agent, sin that uh, uses these agents to try to attack you, the sin nature. We're freed from the power and dominion of the sin nature. We're sanctified. We're freed from the power and the call of the world. We're sanctified. We're freed, freed from the power and the call of powers of darkness that come against us. We're sanctified and we're freed from the pull of the flesh, this inward portion of us that has been demented and damaged by the effects of the fall and the other agents of sin. My friend, there is nothing in you and around you and about you that Jesus Christ can't change and has not already defeated. There's nothing that is re related to sin that you cannot walk in victory. There is nothing. I'll say it this way. Everybody and anybody can be free from everything and anything, and it begins at self. Salvation. Everybody and anybody can be freed from everything and anything. You can't look at your life and say, oh, my grandfather did that, my father did that, so I'll do that. No, 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 no. You've got a new father. You've been begotten from above. You've been placed into Jesus and set apart for him. So if we're going to be a vessel of honor, we have to understand that we're set apart for, for God. We're freed from the penalty of sin, freed from the power of sin, and instantly, listen, instantly the Holy Spirit, the, who is God, takes up residence within us, born again experience now, not baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's separate and distinct, second for work. But born again brings the power of the Holy Spirit to manifest the truth of the fact that you're sanctified. And he works exclusively as a result of your singular proper faith in Jesus, not trusting in yourself, not trusting in your church, not trusting in your works, not trusting in what you do, but trusting in him now living in you through what Jesus did for you at Calvary. Every Anybody and anybody can be free from everything and anything because of the provision of Calvary, because of what Jesus did for us at the cross, because of what Jesus has put in place for every single person who will believe. Amen. I'm preaching better than your amen. -ing. This is what we've been talking about in the message of the cross for 25 years. A vessel of honor is one who is sanctified, and we understand that there's a progression. We understand that there's areas of our heart and our mind that need to be changed. Somebody say amen with me. And that's really more than progressive sanctification. It might be biblically 
more appropriate to call it the renewing of the believer because the renewing of the believer is the work of the Holy Spirit that begins its salvation, that begins the transformation of who you were, how you thought, what you felt, how you acted, and starts turning you into something other than what you were. When I got saved, I was instantly changed, but I was progressively set free from the alcohol, set free from the drugs, set free from the quaaludes, set free from the different drugs that I was doing, and set free from the pull of, 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 of the things that uh, dominated, such as cigarettes and tobacco and Copenhagen and... In 90 days, those things were gone. And then he started in, listen, on the hard stuff. The renewing of the believer. Titus says that uh, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Ghost. See, the renewing of the Holy Ghost, the renewing of the Holy Ghost. This process is, that's why when we get saved, things begin to change. You can't stay the same and be born again. Romans 12 and 2 informs us, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed, listen, by the renewing of your mind. And your mind here in the Greek is the word noose. And it does not mean just your thinking capacity. Mind in the term noose deals with the entirety of the human heart, everything that's in your spirit, everything that's in your mind. So we have to be changed, transformed. If we want to be a vessel of honor, we've got to allow this transformation this process to not only be embraced by faith and grace, but for it to happen. Ephesians chapter 4, Paul says to the believer, talking about progressing in sanctification, progressing and being renewed. Ephesians 4, that we put off the old lifestyle, the former conversation of the old man, which is corrupt, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man. So our are you following me? If we want to be a vessel of honor, we've got to enter into this understanding of, sanct of sanctification, how it's first done. We have to understand that. And then we have to enter into the process of being conformed into the image of Christ, being renewed in our hearts and minds day by day by day. This ought to be the focus of your existence. This ought to be the most important aspect of your life as a believer. If you want to push forward to be a vessel of honor, you're going to have to have this renewing, ongoing day by day. You're going to have to understand what Jesus did for you at salvation, what he did for you at the moment of salvation, how he has defeated the powers of darkness for you, and then asks you to advance in the victory that he's provided. That's the message of the cross. Not me earning it, but me depending on learning how to trust and receive the benefits of what God has done for us at Calvary. And in all of that, again, I'm telling you things in this church that you should know. Then you should already, already have deep within your heart and your spirit. So I hope I'm not boring you. But what causes this ongoing, never-ending renewing, this progression in the sanctification that you have already been granted and given is the proper object of faith. And boy, have we hit that over the years. That means that your faith is designated towards a certain object in a certain direction. And in, in this case, it must be in the understanding of who Christ is and what Christ has done. That's how you were set free. That's how you gained all that you have as a Christian and the object of your faith being Christ and him crucified guarantees the maneuvering and the work and the renewing power of the Holy Spirit. That's what has to happen if you want to be a vessel of honor, if you want to be what God wants you to be. And it's a never-ending process. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed 
day by day, day by day by day by day, faith in Christ and what he's done, renewing me, changing me, causing me to act different, live different, think different, feel different, love different, desire different desires. It's God that gives us the desires of our heart. That doesn't mean that he's just going to give you everything you want. If you let this renewing process, this progression in sanctification occur, then what's happening is that your inward man is being bent toward the nature and character of God, and you'll start to desire the same things that God does. You'll want what God wants, and it won't be this, oh, I have to give up this and that. It'll just be out of the newly formed fabric of this wonderful creature that God is creating through the power of the Holy Spirit because of your knowledge in Christ and the cross, because of the object of your faith. He's renewing you. He's changing you, and we're becoming something. We're becoming Becoming what Paul wanted Timothy to become, a vessel of honor. We have to be one who is sanctified. Then secondly, he said that he wants us to be meat for the master's use. Well, here's how we get ready to be utilized. We become profitable or useful. Let me tell you, if you're not letting God change you from what you are, if you're not letting him taking out some of them stanky attitudes... Wrong way of thinking, wrong way of reacting, then, ladies and gentlemen, you're not experiencing what you need to experience to be a vessel of honor. Sanctification stopped somewhere at salvation, and now you're interested in other things. You can't afford to be interested in anything other than your change, the change that God wants to provide in you and move in you. That's got to be the centerpiece of your life. And then you'll be profitable. Then you'll be useful. Then you'll be mama's china and not Fido's bull. Not only will we be meat for the master's use, but we'll be prepared unto every good work. We've been talking about this on the program, so again, I am repeating myself, and I don't mean to bore you, but Ephesians 2 and 10 says that if we are operating by faith and grace, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, then we become his workmanship. Wow. I want to be the vessel that God produces. I want to be the vessel that God makes. I want to be that person that God forms into a special purpose for a special reason. But most of all, I want his nature and his character. I want his heart and his mind. I want that birthed in me. I want that worked in me. And the only way that happens is we become his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. There it is again, that union with Christ, crucified with Christ, buried with him, raised up with him to live in him from a brand new source of power. I'm in Christ we are his workmanship created. Only God can create us into what we need to become created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Sometimes when we preach the message of the cross, we're so busy teaching the theology and so busy teaching the process that people say, well, Brother Larson, you guys just, you just don't, you just don't, you just don't deal with enough of what we're supposed to do. Well, you get around church and there's a lot of do-do. And I want you to do, but I want you to do it from the source that God has provided, not just trying to put on a show. I said at the beginning of the message tonight, the world is sick of it. There's a, there's a world out there, I believe, that is hungry for what we can have if we'll exhibit it, but we have to experience it to exhibit it. We have to become something in order to share something. Not just point to theology, not just point to knowledge, 
but have that knowledge and that theology be so impacting in us that you and I are changed into something that doesn't look like anything else on the planet. And when that happens, the people in the world will say, that's a different race of people. That's a different system. They're even, how about this, Christ-like. Maybe we'll call them Christian. And if we're going to be a vessel of honor, then we need to be sanctified, meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Now, Paul had told Timothy in verse 21, and I told you I'd come back to this, so let's deal with this. Now that we've laid the foundation of theology and the process of change, which Again, I'm probably boring you, but I hope I'm giving you some information that will encourage you to believe what you need to believe in order for this process to happen. Timothy is told by the Apostle Paul, if a man therefore purge himself from these. So I come to you tonight and I say, I want you to understand the process, but there are some things that you need to be purged from. There's some things that you need to be separated from. There's some changes that you need to make uh, in regard to the things that you see and the things that you are. Oh, now you're talking law to me. No, I'm not either. I'm talking righteousness and holiness. I'm talking that there ought to be something that you see that you're no longer comfortable being around and being with and being connected to. You're no longer a part of what you used to be a part of. And Paul, as he goes through this with Timothy, points out some things that believers, people that want to be a vessel of honor, should in fact purge themselves from. Go with me to verse 14 in the text, and you'll find this that he says, and that's really where this whole text begins in paragraph. He says to Timothy, of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit. And then down in verse 16, he says, but shun profane and vain babblings. Verse 23, foolish and unlearned questions which gender strife. Can I ask you, is there arguments that you're having that just involve words and theology? Are you just fighting with other people about what it is you believe and what you think? Have you just decided that argument is the best way to address the situation? You know, the problem with striving about words and shun profane and van, vain bob, babblings and foolish and unlearned quest, questions is in the end of the disputing about the words, we're not really seeking for truth. We're looking for the victory for the speaker. I'm right. You're wrong. How about social media? Sometimes I look at things that are going on in social media and I think, this is stupid. We're not, we're not, we're not presenting the gospel. We're arguing about things that don't make any difference. And, and I know that this example you probably wouldn't see a whole lot of, but I'm trying to be nice. What you write on social media or what you say in front of a, a film and a camera or so much of it is live today, you need to be careful because the Bible says is that all we're doing is arguing about what it is that really doesn't matter, that we're not only hurting ourselves, but we are in fact hurting those that hear us. The world doesn't hear, need to hear a bunch of nonsense. Well, if God is almighty, can he build a rock he can't lift? Conversations that do not profit, that do not bring you somewhere. You want to be a vessel of honor. You're going to have to lay aside some of these ideas that you think are so special and wonderful and let God do something in you in regard to just wanting to share the truth and not get in an argument on social media or with friends or fellow Christians just so that you can prove that they're wrong and you're right. That's not what truth is for. Truth is 
to benefit us in the, in the formation of Christ, not to make me smarter than you and you smarter than me and you, well, you just need to come up to my level. Okay, I am preaching better than you, amen. And striving about words to no profit, profane and va vain babble. You need to purge yourself. Stop it. Well, I wish you'd go back to the message. I'm preaching the message of the cross. This is what it stops. This is what brings it to an end. When you don't have to be right about everything. Secondly, he says that in verse 17, he said, there's words that are eating as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenius and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past. You not only need to shun profane and van, vain babblings and words to no profit, but you need to shun false teaching. When you recognize it, step away. It's not to be a part of your life. You've got to step away from it. You've got to move away from it. I know that in some of the Christian communities, it's just, well, let's just love everybody, and I want to love everybody, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. i got to hurry, but we'll talk about that. But at the same point in time, if someone is teaching or preaching false doctrine, you need to step away from that. You need to purge that out of your system. You need to get rid of that. If you want to be a vessel of honor. Then he said this. He said in verse 19, here we're talking about what we're purging. We need to depart from all iniquity. Okay, I am preaching better than your amen. And are you okay tonight? No, I it must be the cold weather. I like the weather, by the way. I it's not, can't be cold enough for me. I, I like it. Come into the studio after Gabriel's shift, and boy. I'm telling you, you got a heater. Robin comes out of there, his face is all red, and he's sweating, and whoever else you got with you, looks like they've been hanging over an oven for 10 hours. He likes it warm. He's not lying to you. That's not iniquity or false doctrine. That is... But the process of, of all this is, again, there's, we need to depart from iniquity. Are you conscious of what the Bible says is iniquity that is oftentimes found in believers? Let's just look at some of the things not necessarily found here, but especially in chapter 4 of Ephesians, and I don't have time to teach it. I'm down to 10 minutes, and i got to rush. Listen what Paul says in Ephesians 4. You need to quit lying. You need to quit giving the devil place. Christians, you need to stop stealing. You need to lay aside corrupt communication. That means quit cussing. You need to stop grieving the Holy Spirit. Now, some of those are pretty obvious, but here's some that really hit home. You want to be a, you want to be a vessel of honor? Here's some things you need to get rid of. Bitterness. How about wrath? Anger? clamoring, evil speaking. Well, it's true. Do you know that it's slander even if you're telling the truth, if you belittle someone else's character? That's still slander. It's not to be a part of you. Purge yourself from this. Bitterness, anger, unforgiveness, malice. You want to push them off a cliff and tell God they slipped. You can't wait till they die and get out of your life. Malice in the heart of a born-again believer. Purge yourself. Paul's not writing to the lost in Ephesians 4. He's writing to believers. Bitterness, wrath, anger. How many of us walk around with bitterness and mad at somebody for something, unforgiving and, and, and full of malice? How many of us are dominated by that spirit? That's not the spirit of your God, and that's not the nature and character of a vessel of honor. And it can all be gone. 
through faith in Christ and what he did for you at Calvary, but not if you don't recognize it's in you and you don't submit it to the process. If you okay it, if you come up with your reasons for holding it, sometimes we hate, we, we hate to let go of our hate. We love to hate. We like to lay in bed at night and grit our teeth and grab our fists and think about how we could punch them in the nose in the name of Jesus. And I can't wait till God gets them. That's not the nature and character of your father. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him. That's the nature and character of your father. He says we need to purge ourselves in verse 22 from youthful lusts. And this is probably the arrogance of youth, the self-sufficiency, the high opinion of ourselves. We haven't yet learned how to listen to anybody else or communicate effectively. We just know everything. And our opinion is the highest opinion of all. We've got to be smarter than everybody else. Just ask me. I'm 20-something, and I know everything. I know because I was 20-something once. And sometimes it goes into 30-something and 40-something and 50-something. Purge yourself of these things if you want to become a vessel of honor. You must not strive, verse 24, quarrel. Where we get, allow our spirit to get out of control, Proverbs 13, 10 says, only by pride cometh contention. You know why arguments get out of control? Because we're full of pride and don't want to even slow down long enough to let God do something in us. Most arguments at home are all about me being right and her being wrong or her being right and I'm wrong and we're not going to admit it. And nobody wants to stop or slow down until we practically destroy our family because we just won't slow down and practice our shut-ups and think about what's being said our spirits are out of control. I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking to Christians who have access to the Holy Spirit to control this. He said this in Proverbs 16, 32, he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh the city. We're fighting each other. We're opposing each other. We're hurting each other because we out of control. The Spirit of the Lord is not in it. We're quarreling and arguing and fighting. Purge yourself of these. Well, I liked it when you were talking about drugs and alcohol. Yeah, that's why I said after he got done with that in me, he had to start working on the hard stuff. It's easy to point a finger at the alcoholic and the drug addict, say they need to be changed, they need to purge themselves of that. How about if we look at ourselves and say, that needs to change. The vessel of honor must also not only purge himself of something, and I gotta hurry with this, but he also needs to add something. In this passage, we find it. Singers, musicians, come on, make your way back. He needs to add something. The Bible says to this, to those of us that are believers, and this is written to Timothy, for heaven's sake, study to show thyself approved unto God. You need to get your nose back in the book. I mean, you get up and the first thing that you run to is social media. Who tweeted that or X that or Facebook that or I, does, does anybody like what I posted? Do they like me? <laughs> you know, and we run up to that. You need to get your nose in the book. You need to let the word of God start permeating your thinking. You need to set aside that every single hour, every somewhere in the daytime. You need to just be sitting there soaking your spirit and your mind with what God says. 
I'm not talking about studying for a test or a, a ministry. I'm talking about just learning the Word of God. You'll have to discipline yourselves. <gasps> oh, there's law. It's not law. It's study to show yourself approved unto God. God wants you to know his word. You've got it written down in front of you. You've got the Holy Spirit resident within you that can cause that word to come alive. Everything that you need to know pertaining to life and godliness is at your fingertips. Are you paying attention to it? Study. Study. Read it. Let it fill your heart and fill your life. Let him take you to the woodshed. Let him fill you with the blessings of hope and encouragement. And let him correct the areas. Let him expose. The word of God and the spirit of God work together to expose us what we need to get rid of. And also show us what we need to add. All of it through grace and faith. So we purge ourselves of the things that we're not supposed to. But, but now Paul's talking to Timothy to be a vessel of honor. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. And then there's a second part of that verse that says rightly dividing. Oftentimes we don't really correctly understand that part of the verse. Rightly dividing the word of the truth is really the presenting of the word. It's the speaking of the word. So we study it so that we can present it correctly. So that your words, when you talk to other people, are true to the word of God. We study to show ourselves approved unto God, not to make our pastors happy or to impress anybody. God is the one who's trying to plant these character and nature in us. Study to show yourself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, learning the word, presenting the word. Verse 22, following after righteousness, faith, charity, love. I know that there's some in the body of Christ, oh, you're talking about love again. Yeah, because that's the premier evidence of God's working in you through the message of the cross. That the love of God, the love and nature and character of God for the body of Christ and other people is being birthed in you. Don't tell me you understand the message of the cross and you can display a hatred or a total rejection of members of the body of Christ. That's family. And I refuse, I said it before, I'll say it again, I refuse to spit on the family of God. People that have accepted Christ, they may not understand everything I understand. And I may not understand everything they understand. Maybe if I just open up my heart a little bit, I could teach them and they could teach me. i got to hurry. Righteousness, faith, charity, peace, pure heart. Verse 24 Oh, my, I wish I had an hour to teach this. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, opposing, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Maybe they don't understand the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Well, let's get into relationship with them and guide them into that wonderful benefit. Maybe they don't understand the message of the cross, but let's get into relationship with them, come alongside, and it may not be simple, and it may not be easy, and it may not be instant, but there's the opportunity for others to learn because I'm not blasting them into Hades. I'm walking alongside them, trying to teach them about how to receive the nature and character of God, but while I'm teaching them about it, it would be good if I would display it. In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, 
if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. The whole world and much of the church doesn't understand some of the things that we've been teaching for 25 years. More and more every day we're finding the evidence of this teaching, this message going out and affecting and impacting and changing and helping others who, being led by the Spirit of God themselves, are coming out of religious practices that can't provide for them what they need. They're recognizing that law can't change them and the old traditions can't conform them into the image of Jesus. But if we've got truth and we've got knowledge and we've got the answer for them, it has to be exhibited in us first. The farmer has to be a partaker of his own fruit before he takes the fruit to market. We've got to become vessels of honor. Key of F, please. Mm -hmm. To be like Jesus. To be like Jesus. All I ask is to be like Him. Would you stand with me, please? All through life's journey, from earth to glory, oh, I ask is to be like Him. I want to be yes, a yes. vessel of honor. Yes. I don't want to just have the theology. I want the experience of becoming like the one who loved me and gave himself for me so that the world can not only hear the knowledge of Christ and him crucified, but they can see the impact on our hearts and in our lives. And if that's you tonight before we leave, I know we got to hurry and I've been long. Let's just gather around this front for just a moment and make this little song, this little chorus, our heart be to be like Jesus to be like Jesus all I ask, all I ask is to be like Him Thank you, Brother Larson, for that great word. Did you enjoy that this evening? 
one of the things that he kept mentioning, and I hope you understood it, is when the Lord begins to work on you, he works on you and your character. He's making you into something. And I want you to take and apply what he taught you here this evening. If you can do that, watch the Holy Spirit begin to work and change your character. Don't miss the service on Wednesday night. Be in prayer for the share coming up in the morning in just a few hours. We love you. God bless you. Turn around tell your neighbor you love them. you were blessed and enjoyed this live service from Family Worship Center. Family Worship Center, located in Baton Rouge, Louisiana at Jimmy Swaggart Ministries, holds three services weekly, Sunday morning at 10 a.m., Sunday evening at 6 p.m., and Wednesday at 7 p.m., all Central Time. All services are broadcast live on the Sun Life Broadcasting Network, Sun Life Radio, online at sunlifetv.com, and on the free SBN Now app. To join the Family Worship Center Media Church, call one 800 288-8350 or join at jsm.org. Live services are produced by the Sun Life Broadcasting Network.